Right, so even with the delays today, we're going to absolutely have an awesome lecture. And it went very well this morning in Landscape Major, and it will go equally perfectly um, this afternoon. So as a change, as the end of all these lectures that we've been doing since the 23rd of March, um, and, you know, basically to me, this is the end of September, even though it's the 1st of October. So, so it's good that we do the end of more than one civilization. We look at the end of the Mycenaean civilization, the end of the Hittite civilization, the end of the kingdom of Cyprus, the end of the Kassite kingdom, the end also of the Egyptian kingdom, maybe the ending or the beginning of, of the Philistine kingdom, the ending of a number of other kingdoms, including Troy. So all of these occurred somewhere in the region of the 1170s BC. It's described as the year civilization ended. Give or take 10 years either side, all of those civilizations collapsed like a pack of cards. This is a stone associated with the Kassite kingdom. Uh, it's a very well decorated stone. It's almost as if you could be in Jessica's bedroom with a moon and the star up there. Um, but the hairstyles themselves are typical um, Middle Eastern, uh, the likes of the uh, Babylonian world, the li likes of the Sassanid world, the likes of the Parthian world. That very typical beard over the chin, that sort of um, curly type hair, leaders all the same. And this is the type of thing that would be in their civilization from that period before and after that, all the way to the period uh, to the rise of Islam in 651 um, AD, where we see the end of the Sassanid and the Persian uh, worlds and empires. So this, this world itself collapsed. It disappeared. It went for a burden, whatever way you want to look at it. This fell just like... Um, the kingdom of the My Mycenaeans, all within a few decades. Now, naturally, we've looked at this lecture um, a few times this week. And the things that I've drawn out from those lectures are the same thing, the domino effect. Now, it can be described as the bad apple in the barrel. So you've got, you've got a wonderful barrel full of the most nicest cultured apples. And one of those apples goes bad and all the other apples goes bad, right? Metaphor. Um, and it's seemingly in the archaeology and in the history, a plethora of civilizations collapse in the eastern and central part of the Mediterranean, going all the way over to um, Asia Minor, going all the way over to the likes of um, this Neo-Babylonian world. And with one civilization collapsing because of being invaded, or a disease, or a calamitous event, all the other civilizations collapse like a pack of cards, like a domino effect. This is not like Seneca's collapse. This is a collapse. These civilizations lasted 300, 400, 500, 600 years in some cases. And within a moment, they all went. And I've used, I've used the analogy of the European Union. I'm not gonna say this in a political vein, some commentators say with Britain leaving the European Union, the European Union will collapse. The domino effect. One leaves, another one leaves, and they all leave. And what we once offered the European Union, that is going to have to find that from somewhere, somewhere else. The interdependency goes. But this isn't the same as happened in around 1177 BC. This is more dramatic. This is a collapse of civilization on such a scale that most of the civilizations I've mentioned forgot their writing technologies. They forgot their technology. They forgot their connection. They forgot their trade. Everything went out the window. So we look at, the, we look at all these civilizations, even though they're limited, only for a short period of time, but we might be visiting some of these civilizations over the next long months. And I did mention ancient Egypt. This is a cartouche of Ramesses III. Ramesses III was the leader that defeated um, a people known as the Sea People, a people that we can't really describe properly or understand them. 
Ramesses III defeated these people, which then led to the collapse of the ancient Egyptian kingdom, a, a, a massive demise in, in the ancient Egyptian kingdom, all because they defeated these sea people. So in other words, what this pack of cards, if, they, if ancient Egypt hadn't defeated the sea people um, and the sea people hadn't have got to Egypt, Egypt would have collapsed anyway because of, because of the, the situation at the time. It's like, it's like a relationship. You know, I, I shared this with everybody today. My, my grandparents were, um, were together for um, 70 years, right? 70 years my grandparents were together, right? Um, and when my granddad died in 2007, my grandmother fell apart. But when my grandparents were together, they worked with this interdependency. My granddad would get the, um, the newspaper every single morning. My grandmother would make the dinner. My grandmother would go shopping. My granddad would go out and do this. Uh, my granddad would drive the car and all these things. But when my granddad went, the interdependency went. And my, my grandmother as a person collapsed. Um, and th this is what we're talking about. The, 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 there's, I don't agree with, mul I don't agree with um, um, internationalism. I, I don't agree with cooperation with other nations. I'll tell it as it is. Um, I've learned from the past that being an independent nation, um, having to provide for itself is far more powerful than the interdependency that we see with Europe and, and all those other things. That's my own point of view. I don't agree with cooperation with other nations. I believe in being independent. And actually, if all these countries had been independent in the past, there would never have been a collapse in civilization around 1177 years BC, but it happened because they were all trading with each other. They were all with each, in each other's pockets. Um, and that's the problem with internationalism. And a lesson from the past, that's what I feel. I'm not lecturing you. I'm just telling you as it is. So this is this, is this. the year civilization collapsed in 1177 BC. Marauding groups known um, only as the Sea Peoples invaded Egypt. The Pharaoh's army and navy managed to defeat them twice, but the two victories so weakened Egypt that it, it slid into decline, as did most, if not all, of the civilizations around it. And we go into the period known as the Dark Ages in the Mediterranean landscape. This book, a book by a writer known as Eric Klein, this book itself was published in 2014, 1177, the year civilization collapsed. Well, you know, I, I come out with those dates occasionally. I say, you know, on the 14th of October at 515 in the year 1177, this happened. I'll actually, that's, that's what this is. He needed to come up with a time, but things were really starting to go bad around this period, a decade, one way or the other. And it's, it's something that was always, always thought about. You know, when, when Heinrich Schliemann worked at um, Mycenae in um, 1876, 1876, um, he came across this new civilization, the Mycenaeans. And what he saw with the Mycenaeans was that the civilization had been abandoned. It fell apart. And nobody knew why. And then you look in the Bible, the Old Testament, and it mentions a people known as the Hittites. And lots of people believe that the Hittites were fictitious, like they used to think the Philistines were fictitious. But they started finding a civilization in the center of <coughs> Turkey, which turned out to actually be the Hittites. So, you know, I'm very much a believer in the Old Testament. Much of what is in the Old Testament is, excuse a pun, gospel. It, it can be proven in the archaeology. There's very little in the Old Testament that is turned out to be unfactual. You know, you look at the flood story, for example, right? So many civilizations talk about this great flood. We had a great flood, for God's sake. A, a third of the landmass of Europe was lost when the, it was flooded. Um, it was inundated. Doggerland was lost. All those land links were lost. Huge land mass of area was lost. Up to a third of Europe was lost. What, what do you describe that as? 8,000 years ago, 
Is that not a great flood? Is that not something referred to in the Bible? Anyway, let's move away from that. So let's look at, let's look at the landscape. Let's look at the vista. Let's look at the full-blown intercourse these civilizations had with each other. So um, here we go. Let's, um, let's put my annotation back. So these are the Mycenaeans. Do, do, do. Um, and these are the, this is the kingdom of the Trojans. These are the Hittites. This is the kingdom of Cyprus. Yes, Cyprus was an independent world once. This here is Egypt, and this is the area where the Battle of the Delta took place. This here is the kingdom of the Philistines. This here is the kingdom of the Assyrians. And this is the kingdom of the Neo, um, the Neo Babylonians. And there are other kingdoms along the way as well, which we will mention, which we will mention. But these are the most important ones. Now, I've not done a lecture like this one. I've looked at lots of lots of different civilizations and taken a little bit of a snapshot. But I do believe me that we, I will be looking at some of these civilizations again, um, other than ancient Egypt. Everyone does ancient Egypt, but do they do Assyria? Do they do the civilization of Troy? The answer is no. But anyway, um, so looking at this map, so what you can say is that there's an interchange between these lands, an interchange between these lands, an interchange between this land, an interchange between this land, an interchange between this land, and there you go. There's also trade links from the east. All of this links together. There's also trade links with um, Sicily. Oh, let's mention copper. Let's mention let's mention tin and all these wonderful things. The Kyrenian ship, um, the ship found off the coast of northern Cyprus in the late 1960s, excavated in the 1960s. A ship full of copper ingots. This great trade, a kingdom trading, Cyprus with the Mycenaeans. And then the ancient Egyptians so respected the Mycenaeans, everything worked together. But when you've got that interdependency, your guard is put off hilter. You, you look at the example of the Second World War, Europe, the League of Nations, Europe thought it was so special. They thought there was, there was checks and balances. Every, everybody's come, gonna come to each other's rescue. They didn't. The only country left in 1941 was actually Great Britain all alone. And the point is, because of that interdependency, that interreliance, it didn't stop the Germans. If they had been individual nations, probably the Germans could have been stopped sooner. But that's my thoughts on this. So 1177, the year civilization collapsed. Marauding groups known as the Sea People invaded Egypt. As we've already said, the Pharaoh's army and navy managed to defeat them, but the victory so weakened Egypt that it soon slid into, slid into decline, as did most of the surrounding civilizations. What happened at the end of the Second World War? We may have been victorious, but we lost our empire. That's exactly what happened to the ancient Egyptians. They used all their resources to defeat these sea people. All the other countries had been lost. And the ancient Egyptians then were defeated, a Pyrrhic victory by itself. After centuries of brilliance, the civilized world of the Bronze Age came to an abrupt cataclysmic end. August 1914, Europe, the peace of Europe came to a cataclysmic end. War was started. Um, Europe, from the peaceful land that it once was, from the technical innovations, we dared to war against nations in Europe and it saw the collapse of the civilized worlds in Europe. We keep repeating ourselves over and over again. And not to be a forebringer of doom, um, the civilizations that we lead today and live in are gonna be doomed to failure as well because, of this, because of we don't learn from the past. After centuries of brilliance, the civilized world of the Bronze Age came to an abrupt and cataclysmic end. The end of the Bronze Age. That's the point. The, here comes the Iron Age. Here comes the new kids on the block. 
Kingdoms fell like dominoes over the course of just a few decades. No more Mycenaeans. No more stories of the Trojan, the Hittites in the Bible, the Babylonians, and so on. The thriving economies and the cultures of this period ceased to exist. The great writing systems that kept everything recorded and the great writing systems of, do you know what we have? We have sad letters in the 1170s of kings and kingdoms that no longer exist, the kingdoms that we haven't even mentioned, writing to other kingdoms, please come to my aid, please come to my kingdom's aid. And they never came to their aid. Kingdoms fell. We're not talking about these great kingdoms. We're talking about dozens and dozens of smaller kingdoms, all interdependent, all collapsed at the same time. So this sense of, of link was not just in writing, was in technology, was in trade, was in monumental architecture, a complete break in civilization. In, in, in this look today, and with the look that we see um, with, with Eric Klein's book, um, it's, it's a gripping story. Um, it's, it's a story of interconnected failure ranging from invasion and revolt to earthquakes, drought, cutting international trade links, and a mass wave of people coming from the West, bringing, to, bringing end to the multicultural world of this part of the Mediterranean. The globalization failed. Late Bronze Age, this is when the Bronze Age collapsed, hastened in a dark age, hastened in an age of people that would bring us the likes of ancient Greece, Thebes and Sparta, giving us the likes of the great Assyrian worlds and so on. And then eventually the Etruscans, the Romans and all those other worlds that come after. So with the collapse of these, these civilizations, we start to see the dawn of the modern age. After this dark age, we go into ancient Egypt around 500 years BC and we see the enlightened world that we all look at today. The sense of democracy coming from ancient Greece, the sense of voting from ancient Greece, um, and so on and so on. This is where we, we start to look at civilization. And next, we look at Ramesses III. The great Ramesses III. Let, let, let's look at who this individual was. Now, knowing Billy's been to ancient Egypt, I think Bill said he's been in a tomb of Seti, Seti the first, so surely he's been into the tomb of Ramesses the third. Ramesses the third reigned reigned a nearly wonderful thirty years. He reigned from eleven eighty seven to eleven fifty six. Remember, we go backwards in dating systems, BCE. Um, and when he died, he started off with a with a with a dynasty. Um, that was at its height. For a short period of time, Ramesses' empire was one of the greatest empires that ancient Egypt have had, ever seen. He created that. He defeated the Libyans. He, he fought against the Philistines. He fought against the Hittites and the likes of the Assyrians. But he came across the Sea People in, a, in around 1175. And all that tranquility ended. And we, 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 think about, we think about failures of history. We think about uh, the equivalence of what happened. Without saying any more about this individual, we look at a great battle and conflict he was involved in against the people known as the Sea People. He defeated them once, the Lebanon. But when we look at this story, which we will go into, after the defeat of the Sea People. And the Sea People, from that moment onwards, this great horde of people that spread across this part of Europe and Asia disappeared from history forever. And you think, well, how do we know they existed? Well, we've got carvings in tombs constructed by this great Ramesses. You know, we, we've got, we, we go to the likes of Thebes and Karnak, we, we, we see references. Um, about the great victories over people, including the great sea people. Also, his own, 
his own temple, palace, and town complex at uh, Madinat Habu in, in western Thebes. At that locality, we see carvings and reliefs about the great victory he had over the sea people. We know these sea people existed. We know, we know that they existed, but we don't exactly know who they were. So what I'd like to do is get down to the nuts and bolts of it. So if we go to this, the Battle of the Delta. It sounds like something out of a, 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 a weird movie. So let's, let's, go, let's get to this. So we've got many statues associated with Ramesses. And there is Ramesses' uh, coffin, sarcophagi, um, in the Louvre um, in Paris, um, in Egypt. So we, we can say the following, right? We know that all these civilizations came to an end. We know that they were really badly damaged and, and they never recovered. We know that all these things about writing systems ceased and we know that ancient Egypt collapsed. Um, why was that? Was it just um, the sea people? Was it just one event? Did it happen in a year? The answer is it's a load of different events. It happened over a little period of time. But we know the ancient Egyptians are actually carving these events. So the Battle of the Delta saves Egypt from the people of the sea. And then they, these people of the sea disappear. The ancient Egyptian pharaohs often commemorated military victories over their enemies by having them depicted on the walls of great monuments. One of the most famous conflicts recorded on the walls of Egyptian temples is that of the Battle of the Delta, fought by the pharaoh Ramesses against an unnamed people. In fact, the, the Egyptians don't even give them a name. They, I don't think they even know. Now, you can have great events in history, but very little's left of them. Okay, um, you look at today, right? We've got this, this, this silly little virus, COVID, right? It's not going to leave any signs in the archaeology and very little signs in the history in 100 years' time, right? But it's had a dramatic effect on every single nation on the planet. Very like the sea people. If you, if you, if you look at... Um, for example, the Great Plague of um, 1349. We know that lots of towns and villages were deserted and abandoned, but we've got lots of writing about it, but we can't find the clay, plague pits in many cases, but there was still this Great Plague. Um, if we look at, say, for example, the revolt of Spartacus. So when the revolt of Spartacus, I, I, I need to double check this date, it's around 78 BC, the revolt of Spartacus, uh, that lasted for a very short period of time. Um, who were these people? What did they represent? Nobody really knows. They were slaves, but some of them weren't slaves. A huge mob, mob, mob of people starting in the north of, um, of Italy, marching all the way to the south of Italy. Uh, they defeat every single Roman army in its wake. And then suddenly they're defeated by the Roman army. Um, ev everyone either put back into slavery or they're crucified or they die in the battle. Other than that, we don't know anything more. And who tells us that? The Romans. So if the Roman records didn't survive, we wouldn't know anything about it. Another one, right? Homer's Iliad, right? In Homer's Iliad, it writes about the defeat of the Trojans. But who actually defeated them? Where did these people come from that defeated the Trojans? What about Helen of Troy and her thousand ships? Could that not represent these sea people? Could the defeat of the Trojans have actually been recorded years later as the Trojan world being wiped out by these sea people? Who knows? Who knows? But the archaeology tells us, and the carvings tell, tell us, at this time, something very dramatic occurred. There may have been a tidal wave that like, wiped out loads of... Um, little villages and so on in the Aegean. But then you have these sea people. There may have been a disease that hit the, um, the likes of the Philistines, but these sea people really damaged the Philistine um, sense of community. And there are all these different things. There was all these events that led to one thing, right? So let's have an argument with Michelle tonight. She turns around and says, uh, 
She says, right, I, I don't want anything to do with you. She calls me James. I don't want anything to do with you. Um, um, you never do the washing up. Um, and I turn around to say to Michelle, well, you never do the washing. I always wash the clothes. And then we break up the relationship on that. And years down the line, uh, she says to everybody else, what broke the relationship up was the fact that James never does the washing. And I say to everybody else, well, Michelle never washes the clothes, right? But actually, there would be a thousand other reasons why the relationship broke up. There's a thousand other reasons why all these civilizations came to an end at this point. But like many things, it ended at one point in time because of all these different reasons. With a huge backpack of reasons, all these civilizations came to an end. And one of the big reasons are these sea people, but it's not the only reason. So again, we see this carving. It's described as a Philistine ship of war. Now, um, some say that, in fact, the Philistines may have been um, infiltrated by the Sea People. And actually, some of the Sea People actually survived, and the Philistines become great, and the Bible, and all this stuff, right? But what we're talking about, the Philistines disappeared, really, from history. They, uh, that's that again. The Sea People disappeared from history. They did disappear from history. The likes of Philistines were recorded, and so were the Egyptians. But eventually, all these civilizations collapsed. So look at that there for... Doesn't that give you the horn? Basically, we're talking about a, a carving, and there is the ancient, uh, the, the, our ancient Egyptian pharaoh on the right. He is seen to defeat these sea people. As the arrows go in, there we go, let's get the arrows in, right? He's got the archers. The arrows go in, and all these sea people get killed, right? Now, the archery is a really important area of this lecture. So, let's do the lecture proper. Let's move away from our pharaoh and let's look. And, and look, look at this behind me. You know, you can, uh, this is where the battle actually took place. Now, all that represents the floodplain of the Nile. There's loads of little rivers leading out, but there's loads of little built, um, villages and stuff over that landscape. So what we'll do, we'll get a nice little background in there. Right. Here we go. Um, you, you, can, you, can, you can see it now. You can, you can see me fighting. Uh, with a towel on my head. So the ancient Egyptians are on the one side and the sea people are on the other side. Now, there's one problem with this illustration. It's likely that this probably didn't happen. Because let's go to the description. The Battle of the Delta is thought to be one of the most influential battles of the whole of history. And it, it was thought to have believed to have happened in about 1177 or 1175. On one side were the Egyptians. Stop yawning. On one side were the Egyptians under Ramesses III, perceived by some to be the last great pharaoh of the New Kingdom and one of the greatest pharaohs of the whole of Egypt. We see in the carvings um, that the people of the, the sea people were described as being the Shadana. Uh, they believe that the Shadana were the people of Sardinia. There was also another, another um, carving saying that the sea people were also the Shek, Shekelesh, the Sicilians. But we're not really sure about that. We're also told that the sea people were the Tejeka of Crete, but we're still not sure about that either. We're also told that some of the sea people were in fact the Palisette, the Philistines, of the Luca, the, the ancestors of the um, Lucians. But that's a lot of people from different areas. The sea people also come from the Balkans. They also come from the Black Sea area. In fact, what it is, is like uh, the, the Spartacus uh, revolt. It's a group of people who just want to keep going and destroying civilized worlds. And somebody asked me, why did they do that? And the answer is, why was there a Spartacus revolt vault in the first place? Where were they doing? What were they aiming to achieve? And the answer is, we don't really know. You can, um, you can see Kurt Douglas in the film. Kurt Douglas says, we want freedom. We want to be free people. Well, is that, is that what happened? So, anyway, let's go back to this. 
So what, what we do see, we see, we see the destruction of all these worlds that we've, we've mentioned, the Mycenaeans, the Hittite, and the Metani. The Metani were another people, another kingdom that could be seen on the Turkish peninsula. The ferocity of these raids uh, is also echoed in an inscription uh, in the mortuary uh, chamber of Medinet Habel. And the description of the Pharaoh gives this, not one stood before their hands. In other words, not one nation stood up against these sea people and numerous cities were laid to waste as we see in the hieroglyphics. Egypt seems to have been the last target of the aggressive warriors. Um, prior to the Battle of the River Delta, Ramesses III had obtained a great victory over the Sea People, but it was a feint. Uh, if anyone knows what the word feint means, it was a ruse de gar. It was to lead out. You could tell I've been watching too much Sharp because I get those words from Sharp. Uh, the rude de gar, basically to lead your enemy into a false sense of security. A feint. Basically, with a feint, what you do, you lead an army out into an area. You, 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 you probably know that you're going to lose. But at the same time, your main army is going to invade. And, and Ramesses III knew that this was happening. But Ramesses III also knew that the army he faced at, at near Lebanon, at the Battle of Giala, um, you know, he could have lost that battle. He nearly lost it because the arms that the sea people had were so far superior to the arms that the ancient Egyptians had. Remember, at this time, iron was being introduced. We've, now, we've come to the end of the Bronze Age. This is what we're talking about. So iron is being introduced. Um, and it may have been that the sea people actually had iron weapons and the Egyptian didn't. So how was he to deal with this? Well, Ramesses III was to have his own feint himself. What he did, he sent his navy out. He sent his navy out far beyond the, the delta uh, of the, um, the, 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 the Nile floodplain. So he said, right, what we're going to do, we're going to lose the navy. We're going to lose the Egyptian navy. But what we're going to do, we're going to fill the vessels with tens of thousands of arrows and thousands of archers. So we're going to send them out. And on a given point in time, when the last of the sea people's navy enters the river Nile Delta, right, then you're to attack. But you've got to wait until the first attack is completed. Because Ramesses III knew full well that if he was to face a land battle against the sea people, he would lose. And given the lack of other resources, it has been suggested that Ramesses, um, Ramesses needed to undertake um, this um, feint. So what happened was that um, what happened was exactly as I've described the entire navy of the sea people headed into the River Nile. Um, and they had it easy. They, they captured Alexandria. Uh, things, things were fairly easy for them. So the sea people um, invading this e Egyptian landscape. Um, also, Ramesses also knew that his sailors were in far inferior to the sea people's sailors. Their ships were less technologically advanced as compared to the sea people's ships. If they had hijacked vessels from the Mycenaeans or they'd sailed all the way from Sicily, their vessels were naturally far more superior. So he also said, let's not engage them in open water either. So basically it allowed them um, to sail unopposed into the Nile Delta. And these vessels were powered by both sail and oar. The Egyptian ships were more maneuverable and maneuvered at the back of the of the navy of the sea people the sea people were completely unaware of this and as the sea people managed to get to the shoreline Ramesses laid out volleys upon volleys of arrows into the ships of the sea people and what would happen is that the vessels would then be laden down with the dead of these people and as the, as the 
as the sea people are thinking, right, what we need to do, we need to get back into our vessels, go back out to sea and replan this. Then came a volley of arrows that blackened the sky into the vessels of the sea people from behind, from the ancient Egyptian ships themselves, from the pharaoh ships themselves. And, and then when the sea people were panicking along the banks of the River Nile, um, what also happened was that they would chuck in um, grappling hooks into the vessels of the sea people, in doing so capsizing the enemy ships. So, you know, with all the, this strategy, the ancient Egyptians were able, able to win the day, but at great cost. Large numbers of the pharaoh's army now lay dead, Large amounts of the Pharaoh's um, resources had been used out. He emptied his treasury to not only pay for equipment, to pay the wages of the soldiers, and to actually pay for mercenaries, money that was going out of the country. This may have defeated the sea people, but it was a Pyrrhic victory because with so much, many of the ancient Egypt's resources used, it was to be the downfall of the ancient Egyptian world. So let's look at a few more images. Okay, so we've done that one. We're now going, looking at the Hittites one a little bit. So looking at this, this is the Lion Gate at Hatutsa, the capital city uh, of the Hittites, the Lion Gate. If anyone shouts out and said, isn't there a Lion Gate at Mycenae? Funnily enough, there is. Built exactly the same time as this one, but these are completely different people. So let's tell you a little bit more about these sea people. Let's just read out what I've got. It said for not just a couple of decades, for a century, these sea people developed uh, into a band of people that wreaked havoc, ha havoc on the Mediterranean. But by this point, this is when they were at their greatest point, into the 1170s. One writer um, wrote... They came from the sea in their warships, and none could stand against them. There are various accounts very similar to that, very similar to the accounts of the Pharaoh himself. Accounts of the sea people attacking the worlds that we've mentioned in Egypt, Turkey, Syria, uh, Palestine. They may have even, they may even toppy, toppled completely the great Hittite empire. So you can imagine, right? Anyone that knows the Bible will know of fighting between the Hittites, the Philistines, and the ancient Egyptians. They're always tossing off in battles. They're always fighting. They're always, they're always, that's in the Bible, right? It's there. Um, and usually the Hittites would defeat the ancient Egyptians. So you can imagine the Pharaoh sat on his throne and a messenger comes in and says, look, Pharaoh, babes, look at the message I've got. So you give her the message and the Pharaoh would say, Oh my God, the kingdom of the Hittites has been defeated by an unknown foe. The Hittite cities have got great walls. He's thinking to himself, this letter tells that the entire Hittite world is up in flames and the Hittites have even defeated us. How are we to defeat the enemy that's destroyed the Hittites? So you can imagine the Pharaoh's worried at this point. He is worried. So the victory that he had over the, the Sea Peoples was a great victory. Um, so Med, uh, Medinet Habu, they desolated its people. They desolated its people, referring to the people of Turkey, the Levant, Syria, Cyprus. And its land was like that which has never come into being. So that's a really interesting quote. Very interesting quote. Uh, we'll read that again. And its land was like that which has never come into being. And why is that an interesting quote? It's simple. If you look at landscapes like Wales, the very ugly upland landscape of the Brecon and Snowdonia, without trees, just rock, um, just, just a barren landscape, right? That was created in the Bronze Age. A few hundred years before this event is happening in... Um, ancient Egypt and Turkey and elsewhere, but that landscape has never been really properly used again. Nobody's really gone up there and farmed those landscapes since. And folks, 
there are large tracts of Turkey, the Levant, going all the way over to Babylonia, landscapes that were never ever used again, desolated. Was it because of these sea people? Was it because of a load of events coming together? Yes, it's that, a load of events coming together, which makes the landscape uh, a landscape that has never come into being before. So, you know, we think about, you know, these people working together, these great sort of, these great people. Um, some say that, in fact, um, it could have been the people that eventually occupied uh, the landscape of the Levant, Le Lebanon and all the rest of it, the Philistines, but others argue, well, the Philistines were already there or did the sea people go over there and they were friends with the Philistines, all these different things and so on. Um, it, they are very, very mysterious, very, very mysterious. And all, so are the other events like famine and natural disaster at that time. Whatever their origins, the sea people returned to Egypt. Uh, they, they, they destroyed Egypt. Ah, oh, start again. That again. I was going on to something else then. Uh, the sea people went to Egypt and they were destroyed by Ramesses III's marshaled forces. Um, and all this discussion about raining down with arrows and all the rest of it um, makes me think of the Battle of Cressy in 1346. It also makes me think of the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. The, the, the English um, with their Welsh um, traitorous supporters uh, went into battle against the French. We, we, they, they knew full well that they couldn't defeat the French cavalry, but they could defeat the French cavalry using archers, using simple bows and arrows. And then the bow and arrow, uh, the long bow, become a very important weapon of warfare. And you can think about this, you can think, well, you know, this was actually done by Ramesses against the sea people. He knew he couldn't defeat them properly with his weapons at the time, but he knew he could defeat them with um, the bow and arrow. Um, and this is, this is what Ramesses thought. As for those who reached my frontier, their seed is now not. I have defeated them. Their hearts and their souls are finished unto all eternity. They shall never return. That's what Ramesses thought about these sea people. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to take a break. Um, and are there any questions? Ah, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the New Kingdom pharaohs of Ramesses II and III were, you know, called the last of the great pharaohs. After that, the country went into decline. And the later pharaohs would never have been able to do what Ramesses III did exactly. It would have been impossible, yes. Yeah, but the fact that they are sea people indicates a maritime nation, skilled sailors. So you've got to ask the question, um, which island did they come from? If it was an island. Well, the, 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 the thing is, that, in, 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 the description, in the description, what, what, what it's saying, um, if, we go, if we go back to my notes, um, we'll, we'll check out some of those names. So we we so some of those he, he actually mentioned some of the names in in his temple. So we've got the um, Shekelesh, which were, which some people have identified people from Sicily, and the Shadana, which are people have been identified from Sardinia. All of these are island nations, and the Ch yeah. the Chekia of Crete, but the Chekia of Crete were actually part of the Mycenaean world, uh, and. And nobody really knows who these people are. Um, and if they are sea nations, no. you, you've also got the Mycenaeans being defeated over land as well. So what's happening there? You could talk about groups of people coming from the Black Sea as well. So these are people that need to travel yeah, over water. Yeah. They are yeah. clearly sea people. But where, yeah, it, it yeah. might be that, that yeah. like, like the Spartacus Rebellion, it was a group of people that gathered together with one goal. And we don't really know what that goal is. <laughs> Well, one contender from where they came from, of course, could be an island which doesn't have to be mentioned as having a great kingdom. That's Malta. Because I know certainly the Neolithic peoples and Bronze Age peoples were amazing engineers. They were so well organized that some of the structures and temples you, you, you've seen over there, you know, so it could be them. But one, one other interesting thing you said, Carl, is that it is thought that the sea peoples had iron weapons. Yes. 
which is an interesting comment because you know what I think personally that the Iron Age really should be pushed back further to the traditional date of 800 BC. And I think research over the coming decades will prove what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's so much we don't know, isn't it? As we always say about the ancient period. But uh, certainly it's just fascinating to speculate even, isn't it, really, to get some logic into it or what you think is logic. Which well, may not the, be at the end the, of the day. The thing is, what we think is logic today is something very different from what they thought back then. Uh, yeah, you know, of course, yeah. You know, why, why, why were they all ganging together? Why would they want to defeat these nations in the first place? They don't even have children. How yeah. about, you know, yeah. know what I'm saying again? They don't ha even have uh, children and wives with them because how would they be able to keep them on board vessels and feed them? So, you know, what are they, what are they aiming to do, you know? Surely if, you're yeah. gonna, surely if you want slaves and all the rest of it, why do you keep going? Why are you going to keep these slaves? There's no sense to what they were doing. And, and the mistake I made earlier on, the date for the Spartacus revolt is not 78, is 73 BC. So I'm out by five years, but nevertheless, that's fine. Uh, what about you, Jess? Um, I wouldn't mention that. <laughs> I've heard of sea people before. I think I've read something about it being um, near sort of like the Fira area area um not sure whether that's true that again there's loads of theories to where they have come from but the what area fira oh fira all oh, right as in the island yeah as in santorini yeah right okay fair enough go for it keep going um no the, I, i've just read i remember reading something a while back of something that they came from there a theory of that but it was a very weak theory, but it's where I sort of first heard of them. Yeah. yeah. Have you recovered from the explosion a few hundred years earlier, though? I wonder. Maybe, but the thing is, mm. when you think about it, the, that would only be a small number of people. Do you know what I mean? The, you, you're talking mm. about this is a big group of people d destroying whole empires. It's like a low. What could happen? Uh, it's, it's like um, a scourge of locusts. Um, so you've got a small number of locusts, then more hatch out, and then more hatch out, and then they're all going in one direction. Um, and it's just like, um, it's just like all those zombie films that me and Dell watch, right? Um, you get hit packs of zombies coming together, and they're all going to one locality, and nobody knows why. Uh, it, it's like, you know, you know what, you know, um, there, there was a fight on the beach at Ogmore, right? And one person, one person was fighting, and they all were fighting, and nobody could work out why they were fighting. Yeah, so it sounds well. similar to that, to be honest with you. So, Pat, have you got anything to say? No, she's off on a burden. What about you, Dell? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ancient ruins which are sort of quite large on Sardinia, and um, yeah, go on. So, you know, possibly those areas, like you said earlier, you know, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and stuff as well I think in southwest Spain um, which we would sort of traditionally be the Karshish area as the Bible would have put it so anywhere in the, in the sort of western Mediterranean they could have come from yes and I oh. have mentioned the A word yet aliens I'm <laughs> uh, talking about aliens Anne have you got anything you'd like to say no not aliens <laughs> which ones Mention it. Atlantis. Yeah. A aliens. Right, okay then. Yeah. Um, I was what? just going to say, I was just going to say, you know, it reminds me of the tales of the Vikings, you know, um, when we kept saying, oh, they were, they were raping and pillaging and they were doing oh. these bad things. And then you suddenly, suddenly realise that they were just... Uh, looking for trade, you know, they they were just, you know, it could be their perception of these marauding people. Agreed, agreed. So, um, so yeah, because yeah, we don't know. So somebody actually mentioned that today. Actually, exactly the same thing. So yes, oh. great, great minds think alike. Anne, uh, what 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 about you, Henri? And we'll take a break. <laughs> Oh, I find this really fascinating, the fact that uh, we seem to have a, a mystery group um, which obviously was quite sizable because this battle must have been of serious numbers. Yeah. Um, 
and how there's so little record of them, only some scant references. That's right. But but if they this when you think about it, like the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire was here from AD forty three and a little bit before with people coming over um, and to four seven six. Um, if you if you walk in one direction to the next direction across Britain, you you're not going to see any Roman remains at all. A Roman civilization that was here, a, a civilization was here that just over four hundred years uh, left very little, right? So these people, the sea people. Um, around for just a few decades, you're not, they're not going to leave much in, in the way of artifacts. And so it's going to be very difficult to trace them. And seeing as they probably never step, stepped in one place for any length of time, it's going to be very difficult to find their evidence. And also cultural evidence. What did they actually create? If they didn't, if they didn't create anything, how do you know it's them? Yeah, true. But, uh, you know, really fascinating. Thank you. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. Um, and uh, Jessica can tell you all about um, her hair on her head. <laughs> right, so, so I'm going to take a break myself now. So uh, there you go. Me shall my bell. La 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 oh Michelle I love you I love you I love you la 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 I thought that was quite good of me singing that then Oh if we if we do that there you could got your own green screen there you go And you look you're looking more like a witch every week Oh, if you put a green, put a bit of green on that green. Oh God, I've got to stop this uh, recording as well. Sorry for that, people. Here we go, stop the recording. We're, we're on the last Homewood stretch. And we are looking at the Lion Gate at Hatutsa. And what I would like to do is tell you a little bit about the Hittites. Not a great deal, and then we'll sort of move on um, to the Mycenaeans. So what we see is the Hittites, we, as archaeologists, we've got their archaeological remains. We've got some Hittite writing. Um, we, we, we know they existed. They're mentioned in the Bible as well. Um, but the Hittites are still very much a civilization that needs a lot more research to research them. Uh, they're not as well known as the Mycenaeans, for example. The Hittites occupied the ancient region of Anatolia. So if you look at, the, if you look at what's behind me, it's the blue area on the plan behind me. That's the, that's the kingdom of the Hittites. Now, that was the kingdom of the Hittites roughly around uh, um, 1,300 years BC, so 100 years before they become the great Hittite world. Um, and they're, no, they're named after the Hattai people. Uh, and they were great rivals to the ancient Egyptians. Now, this is how we know a little bit about them, because, you know, we see the tussle between the, the Hittites and the ancient Egyptians. Um, they're, they're copiously mentioned by the Hebrews in their Tanakh and obviously in our old uh, Christian uh, Testament. So obviously we've, we've got letters. Uh, um, we, we, we've got letters to and from the Egyptians and the Hittites. So we've got some, some record, but again, we don't really know as much about them. Now, this is actually a gateway. Look how thick the gateway is. Some of, their, some of the walls of their structures... Uh, the, the defensive walls were eight meters thick, just like the Mycenaean ones. So again, looking at this plan, you can get a good idea of their landscape. They're very much, they're very much going to be affected from attack from the north, the, um, the Black Sea. Obviously, the other peoples towards the, um, the west. Um, and obviously, this, the, um, uh, the Assyrians and other worlds towards the east, not so much prone to attack from the sea than the south, other than the kingdom of Cyprus. Um, but we do know about the constant warring um, along this very contentious frontier. 
uh, Byblos. And, and this land itself uh, is the no man's land of history. So let's not, this sort of bit is the no man's land of history. Going back amongst the Philistines, uh, then you've got the likes of the Egyptians, um, and then you've got the, the native peoples of the landscape, the the, uh, the, um, the Bedouins and so on. So it's a sort of a very mixed landscape. It was very much walled over. But we know that they existed. That's the main thing. They're, um, they're divided into the old and the middle and the new kingdom, as we see with the descriptions of ancient Egypt as well. Uh, the archaeology and language, little was known of the Hittites. Um, other than what was in the Bible until the 1800s. And we're still learning, learning about them. The, the, the city that we've mentioned is uh, this one here, Hattusa. Uh, that's where the Lion's Gate is from. And this is described as a vast fortress city sprawling over the rocky terrain with craggy citadels and elaborate temples. It became the center of a powerful empire that covered not only most of Anatolia, but also at times extended far to the south into Syria and the Levant, as we've already described. So, um, you know, this, the site of Hattusa was first recognized in 1884 um, by an Irish missionary, actually, um, which is rather odd, an Irish missionary, an Irish missionary called William O'Rourke, right? Oh my God, look, there's some buildings over there and he stumbled over and he broke his nose. Anyway, then the uh, German archaeologists excavated there in 1906, as they would. Um, and the famous archaeologist Winkler had recovered 10,000 clay tablets from the Hittite Royal Archives. These tablets on which they had recorded their history and transactions. So in other words, we started to learn a lot more about them. But still, we don't know as much as we could do. Uh, when they were deciphered relatively quickly by Winkler, because he knew his stuff. It's in the old Hittite script. So there's lots to be said about this. You know, uh, when we get into, um, when we get into the, the late um, Hittite kingdom, um, we see that the Hittite kingdom is not only being attacked by peoples that we don't really know, but also other kingdoms as well. Um, so they very much become very, very weakened by the passage of time. So going through all my notes, because there's lots of these notes, there's lots and lots of these notes. Um, and it sort of gets to the end of this and it basically says, well, the Assyrians destroyed whatever they could um, after the, the Hittites were trying to struggle to get themselves back together after all these problems. So even if the Hittites had survived the attacks of the Sea People, the Hittite kingdom would have collapsed uh, due to the likes of a kingdom which is coming from the east known as the Assyrians. So moving on again, um, if we want to clear that, there we go. And this is, um, again, look at, look at this bit of a carving. This is one of their great leaders. Um, this is one of their kings known as Sut Tupalun Lima um, the First. Um, and the one interesting thing about this, not only just carved all out of stone, but look at that beard, look at that goatee. Um, again, that sort of facial hair, that sort of kept, cropped hair ar around the sort of uh, chin area, very much part of lots of the civilizations of the day. This is, again, at Hatutsa, this is... This is um, the, the Sphinx is um, on guard there. And the reason why lots of the carvings are still really intact is simply because, folks, the city was abandoned. There's our Tutsa on the plan there. We've already seen this. We, we know what the fighting's, fighting's very much alike. Uh, what the, 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 the statues themselves, so the, the statue itself, we're looking at, um, do I have to mention him again? Uh, we're, we're looking at dating back to over um, 2,000 years BC. So it, rather interesting carving, actually. And when you, when you actually look at the carving as well, it's almost as if we quickly go back. It almost looks as if it's um, from Central America. But the giveaway is that goatee. So this is at Hatutsa as well. Now, this is rather interesting. We're, we're talking about... The, the, these great walls that are being built. Um, 
and this looks very much like a um, a stone um, cladded bank. Uh, but again, it's really impressive, and you're thinking, well, how was this city overcome? Um, oh, are there, by the way, that's my mate Nigel Hedrington, uh, the director of Past Preservers. Um, I thought I'd mention him in the lecture. So again, you're thinking they they built really well, but their their civilization did collapse, and their civilization did collapse. Like Mycenae, this is actually the Lion's Gate at Mycenae, uh, and the Lion's Gate at Mycenae is the epitome of the Mycenaean world. Um, and what we do know about My My Mycenae, um, it was originally excavated, found um, by Schliemann um, in 1876. When we say found, there was a little bit of the, the top of this gateway sticking out. Right, this was this was sticking out. The lion gate. So Mycenaeans, um, we, actually, you know what we're going to do? Some of you are probably thinking, oh, we didn't really do the Hittites very much. And we didn't really, actually, I might look at the Hittites in the future because um, the Hittites are a, an intriguing, civilized world. They've got great statues and so on. So we may look at the Hittites in the future. So that's why I haven't said as much about them as I could have. Um, the same as about the Mycenaean. So the Mycenaean civilization uh, is sort of already in existence about the time of the collapse of the Minoans, 1,645 years BC. Uh, the Mycenaeans may have actually developed out of the foundations of the Minoan world. In fact, some say that the Mycenaeans were the Minoans, but that's another debate altogether. So these people were around for 600 years, which is quite a mighty period in time. A first civilization to be well spread, well traded, well connected, uh, much influence. They, they had their writing uh, and they, you know, you've got the, the forms of linear A and linear B, which, which has come down from um, the likes of the Minoans. Um, you've got their extensive knowledge um, and their extensive naval skills and extensive building religious practice. Uh, and it's said that the, um, the Mycenaeans were a very powerful people. Um, they were a very um, important, influential people, but nevertheless, their kingdom fell. So if you look at the plan behind me, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of purple area. And again, if we want to link in a little bit more history, uh, and again, apologies, you know, you can't go through all these civilizations without going doing them briefly. Uh, that's a representation of um, a boar tusk helmet. Um, and you can basically get an idea um, that this is actually um, carved out of a, um, a hippopotamus's tooth. Um, some say an elephant's tooth, but one or the other. But you can clearly see there the, the, the facial hair is under the chin rather than on the chin itself. Sort of going to, this is sort of a typical my, my, um, Mycenaean feature rather than say a feature of a Babylonian or somebody from the Hittite kingdom, which would have had worn their beard on their chin. Um, so that's looking a little bit more about art. And uh, one thing about this lecture today, what we've done, we've looked at lots of little bits of things, little bits of remains, pottery, carving, uh, just sort of lots of different things to give you an impression of the time. Um, and this civilization is the same civilization that um, you've got the likes of Achilles, Odysseus, um, their exploits in the Trojan War. So all that links together. Obviously, um, Homer's Iliad is being written, written down hundreds and hundreds of years later. Um, but he may have got some of his facts and its information wrong. The Mask of Agamemnon. Well, if you want to put Agamemnon into the story of the Trojan War, this mask itself dates back to 1,500 years BC. Um, and when you think about the Trojan War, roughly around being 1,200 years BC, this is slightly out of date, but it's still known as the Mask of Agamemnon, found in one of the pit graves at Mycenae. Um, and Mycenae being one of the great, great centers, uh, along with um, the Greek Thebes and the Greek Tyrannus, also these names reoccur in ancient Egypt. Um, Orchomenius, um, Argos, Sparta, even, even Athens as well. Um, lots of these localities had great palaces, uh, shaft graves, I impressive citadels, and massive, chunky, cycladic walls around them. 
um, massive walls. And some of these walls themselves um, could be up to eight meters wide. Look at it. They're describing the Cyclopean walls. The, uh, lots of the, the palaces that they had had these Cyclopean walls, uh, named after the word for Cyclops, Cyclopean, uh, because they were really thick walls of about eight meters thick, sometimes by 13 meters high. And somebody asked me, well, they had these great walls, like, like, the, um, like the people of Lycidia, like the people of the uh, Cycladic Islands, and, and so on and so on. They had these great walls, why did they build them? And you're thinking, well, if they had built them at the time that their land was being attacked, they wouldn't have built the walls in the first place. So they built the walls for what reason? Did they fear that there was going to be a threat in the future? Did they fear that there was some kind of mental threat? Were they building the walls as a state to symbol all these different things? All these different questions. But the way that we look at the Mycenae landscape is very different than how we would translate, say, for example, looking at uh, prehistoric Britain, where you build these great things like Stonehenge for reasons that you don't understand, or you might have massive stones to show off that your family's bigger or the other. There's different meanings for lots of these things. So the reason for the demise of the Mycenaean civilization, which occurred in stages, there were different stages when they, when they uh, declined. This is that guy, Eric Klein, who writes that book, uh, 1177. Uh, so obviously my lecture is not built based on the book, it's based on little quotes from the book. Um, so the collapse and legacy of the Mycenaean world coming into the 1200s, few year, going up to about a decade around when there's that great battle of the Battle of the Delta between the Sea People and the ancient Egyptians. Most of the palaces within the Mycenaean world had been abandoned. Um, their, their cities had been set alight. Um, and the, the interesting thing is with archeology span um, at lots of the Mycenaean sites, so you get one site that's abandoned, you get another site that's been destroyed by um, some kind of seismic activity, you've got another site that's been burnt, you've got um, it, and what we do see is there's lots of different reasons for the decline and destruction of the Mycenaeans. And obviously the way that these people change, actually that's a good way of looking at it. not so much people, but change is destroying this world. So um, there is evidence of, um, various degrees of destruction across these sites and some places um, seeing complete chaos, but one or two Mycenaean sites did survive. We can't say that um, every site across all these civilizations was completely lost, um, but the prosperity of the larger sites was lost forever. And what we do see with lots of the larger sites is by around 1100, they were completely abandoned, civilization completely gone, um, and villages were moving in sort of filling the voids. Um, this is a rather interesting thing. This is known as a panolopi. Um, and these, these are sort of, um, you can see the head, head gear there. Um, and this isn't made of iron. This is actually made of bronze. This is bronze armor. And I tell you what, I wouldn't want to go to battle in a dustbin like this. This is really, uh, this is really impressive, but you wouldn't have much maneuverability on a battlefield. And obviously this type of stuff was being abandoned about 200 years later by the time that we get to. And look at this as well. Um, <coughs> somebody questioned me on this today. And I said, this is, um, this is, a, large, um, this is a large earthenware um, container. Sort of, um, you're looking at, um, uh, oh God, is it, is it not Adriatic where it's, uh, Aegean blackware or something, black and white ware. But, but what you've got on this as well, you've got these figures. And uh, it's described armed men departing for battle uh, from the Acropolis of Mycenae. Well, yeah, fair enough. Um, this dates to around the period we're talking about, roughly around 1190, somewhere around there. Um, and what you've got, you've got a spear. Um, on their spear, they got some supplies on their spear. You've got this, this is very different from the Penelope that we've just seen, the, the, the bronze armor. And somebody said, are they actually describing the sea people? And I said, why would you describe the sea people? Why would you make pots about the sea people when your town's just been burnt down? And I'm actually thinking, well, 
maybe these great strong armed warriors had changed into more mobile warriors, but they made, made them a little bit nimble on the battlefield and not as impressive as these sea people. So we know about the, the uh, Mycenaeans, great trading people. Um, the, these are from the palace site of Argolid, um, now on display in the Athens Museum. But obviously they're trading, and all this thing about trade, back to the beginning of the lecture, that sense of trade in these types of vessels, um, and that sense of trade declines and goes away. So what you can see there, um, you can see the kingdom of a lamb, which is one that we've not come across. Uh, this kingdom of Arzawa, uh, which was also destroyed. Uh, the Hittite kingdom destroyed Egypt eventually because of the battle we know about that. Uh, the the, the uh, the Kassite kingdom didn't survive. And it's a bit strange. You think, well, if these sea people are coming this way, like going down this way, and maybe thought this way, um, how did they end up down here? And somebody actually said, well, maybe they've, they've fallen away from the scene because of the domino effect. We don't really know if the sea people actually got to this um, neo-Babylonian um, kingdom um, of the um, Kassites the Kassite kingdom. We don't really know what was going on. So cut that away. And there you've got our Troy over there, Troy. So again, moving on. We've, we, that, that's just showing you the Mycenaean sites, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Mycenaean sites all over those islands and a little bit into um, Turkey as well. Now we're just on to the Kassites. We don't say very much about the Kassites because recently we've, we've done a lot about the, the Sassanids and um, the, the civilization of Ur summer, but I will read out what we've got. Now this is, uh, this is, this is, it says that this is a seal and I think this is actually something different. Uh, this looks like a boundary marker and we'll look at the boundary marker that we're gonna go on to in a minute. Uh, and there's something strange about the Kassites that we'll go into. So, again, this, is, this would be a cylinder seal wheeled um, Kassite um, cuneiform text. Um, and you can basically get an idea that um, the Kassite kingdom is far away from the main throw of the things that are going on. So we'll have a look at this at the end. There's two images that I want to look at at the end. So Kassites, members of an ancient people known primarily for establishing the second... Uh, um, on the Middle Babylonian uh, dynasty, the, the Middle Babylonian Empire. There'd been an earlier Babylon, which we know, hanging gardens of Babylon. Um, and then we've got um, this kingdom collapses and we've got another civilization after it. The, this, this is part of the cradle of civilizations in the Mesopotamian landscape. So what we do have, we've got chronicles of their kings. Um, we have got chronicles of, of, of what's going on. Even though some of it is imprecise, we've got an idea that the Kassite kingdom lasted a whopping 576 years. Uh, and the Kassite kings probably reigned from Babylon itself, the old city of Babylon. Uh, and the last Kassite leader uh, disappears sometime around the 1190s, 1180s, around this time of the catastrophic um, events, or maybe disappeared a little bit later. Um, the Kassite kings appear to have been members of a small aristocracy, but they were efficient rules, rulers and they were respected greatly by their people. And that is a representation of a male Kassite. Can you see the chin there? The, the beard is above the chin and you've got this typical sort of Urian Sassanid look. Um, and so the, the horse uh, was the sacred animal of the Kassites probably first came in, into use in um, the, across the, where we see large uses of horses was uh, probably across this kingdom at this time. Contemporary Kassite records are not numerous, but we do have quite a number. One, um, this is gonna sound one of the most bizarrest things that you've ever heard. And after this lecture, um, you can tell me if this was a bizarre thing, right? Now, if we go back again to this, one major Kassite invention was the boundary marker. A block of stone that served as a record 
of a grant of land by the king to favoured persons. In other words, the Kassite landscape was divided into landscapes marked by boundary markers. So they're marking their territory. The interest of the boundary stones for modern scholars is not only economic and religious, but also artistic. We get an idea of these Kassite kingdoms and their leaders and so on. The temples that the Kassite kings built or rebuilt are mainly in the Babylonian tradition. Although one Kassite innova innovation was this, the use of molded bricks to form figures in release, relief. So I'm thinking of this and thinking, I'm bloody sure I've seen relief um, bricks used in ancient Egypt. But apparently they, they made the innovation of molded bricks um, quite, um, quite a thing across, like, across the Kassite world. And Henry asked me, sorry, what size was that? So these, and actually it doesn't actually tell me the size of, of this, but looking at the table below and so on, I would say that this is about a, a foot or a foot and a half, two foot in height, carved out of a very hard stone. So this would have been really impressive on the landscape, even though they're not massive. So we've got this, we've got these bricks. So, you know, they're able to make relief statues, um, you know, coming out of rock without carving the rock, which is one of their innovations. So this is a landscape of the Kassites. Um, and one thing I would say is the meaning of this. And there's, there's quite an end meaning for this. So what we'll do, it's said that the Kassites were affected by invasions from the Assyrians and from these people, the people of Alam. Uh, so these invaded, these invaded, and there may have been some invasion by the sea people. Whatever happened, uh, these people lost uh, their sense of independence until there was another Babylonian empire. But that would come a little bit later on. That later Babylonian Empire wouldn't last for a great deal of time. It'd probably last for 100 years and then things change again. It said, like the Inca, that the Kassites withdrew to their own home, their old homes in the Zagros mountain range. So they retreated from their landscape like the Inca did at the end of the Incan world um, in the 1530s. I don't know where Jess went. So what we're going to do finally, oh my God, there's lots of going on. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to, I want to make two points now. We'll call it a day. So the first point is this. Now we've already seen this, but what I wanted to, what, what I wanted to do is to sort of encapsulate everything we've said. So from around the 1200s, from about 1190 going into um, the 1170s, remember the, the date range is really rough. At that battle um, in 1175, 1177, the end of civilization in 1177, what you can see is archaeological evidence of destroyed cities. So you're looking at this wave is hitting the Mycenaeans, um, and then you've got a wave hitting Troy, destroying Troy, We've got archaeological evidence of Troy being destroyed at this time. And Hatutza, you've got probably an invasion from up here as well. I would say that would be a true pronged attack. Um, and then you've got the Sea Peoples are going over to Cyprus, destroying Cyprus. They're capturing Cyprus. We don't often mention Cyprus. I've worked on Cyprus and there's reasons why I don't talk about it. Uh, but along the way, the archaeological evidence tells us of other kingdoms, uh, the Philistine kingdom or, or some kingdom of, of the Hittites being taken over here. And then they're marching in. And then there's this great battle here. So let's put, uh, um, let's put this in there. There we go. Bang. Battle. And then we've got a battle here. Bingo. Um, so this, is, this sort of encompasses everything that we've said. And the other strange thing is this, right? You know, we mentioned about the sea people coming from Sicily. Hang on, get rid of that cross. We mentioned about the sea people com coming from Sicily, right? Why is there archaeological evidence saying that there were invasions of Sicily from the east? 
by the same people that were invading uh, the likes of the Mycenaean kingdom. So then it gets very confusing. In other words, even though we think, even though the Egyptians think they knew who these sea people were, the answer is we don't really know. Maybe they got to some stage, we're all going to dissolve and that's going to be the end of that. And then the final image. This isn't Bill standing naked. I've already had that in one lecture. Oh, by the way, anyone who wants these archaeology can recall more stickers. Um, they, they, can have, they can have four for two quid. Anyway, so finally, looking at this, this is a Persepolis, or Persepolis. Uh, um, don't, I'm not going to make the same mistake as I did last night about Kapil Kelim. Uh, but uh, Persepolis was one of the great cities that was burnt down to the ground by Alexander the Great in the year 330. And this is interesting because they refer to this as the gate of all nations. And be around 1200, this would have represented the gates of all nations. However, this, this is uh, a landmark, the gate of all nations. One moment there were all these nations working together and then years down the line, Alexander the Great gets to Persepolis and he burns the city down to the ground. And this, along with a few other remains, are all that we see of the great city of Persepolis. And that is the last um, of this lecture today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, um, are there any questions, Bill? Well, I, I've learned a lot about the three great civilizations of ancient Egypt, Rome, and classical Greece, Carl. Many from going there and visiting the classical site, but also, um, Obviously, watching the TV programs, because over the last few decades, TV's done a great service, actually, yes. in, um, in broadcasting programs about these three great civilizations, because they're the glamour boys, if you like, of the ancient world. But they've forgotten all about the, the Syrians, to, to a large extent, and the Hittites and the rest of them. And Turkey, in particular, is an amazing country. Uh, yeah. I never realized how much stuff was actually packed into Turkey as well, as well you know. But, uh, yeah, mm. it's... There's so much more we don't know about the, the, the civilizations outside the three glamour civilizations. I'd love, to, I'd love to go to these places, I really would. But of course, many of them are in sort of um, war-torn war, um, war, war countries, aren't they? And um, unstable countries, unfortunately. There's uh, so much yeah. out there. Yes. And that, yes. I, exactly, Bill. That's the idea of East and West. And do you know what? I will always regret and always be very angry with that war in 2003. I would be talking on two levels. I would be yeah. saying that we've still got most of the archaeology intact. And I would also be saying that I've seen it. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Carl. That's my bit. That's been a good lecture again. So that's good. So what we'll do... Um, uh, um, not Amy. God, she's not with us tonight. Uh, Jessica, are you still there, Jessica? Yeah, sorry, I had connection problems. I, I just, I just want a quick chat about something. Anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, not yet. So, we'll, um, Dell, anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, really enjoyed that. Really, you know, opened my eyes a bit about some some of those other civilizations. I've heard of a lot of them, but didn't really know how interconnected they could they were at one time and it's given me something now to think about with the sea peoples yes thank you for that what about you what about you patricia yeah everything's okay enjoyed it thank you so much <laughs> okay um, Anne, and don't keep us too long so Anne, you've got you've got you've got one sentence <laughs> all right then let's move on um <laughs> Henry, anything you'd like to say? I oh, just really enjoyed that. Um, it's opened up a, a lot of things to go and have a look at now. Um, and clearly it was a time of quite a lot of turmoil because you look at your, your drawing there. There were things coming left, right, centre, going backwards. Um, you know, it makes the EU Brexit arrangements uh, a party. Well, I actually, you know, but what we can see is what we're seeing now with Europe. People, people are saying, 
you know, mm. if, if you look at the past, right, let's just not be, you know my feelings on Europe, by, by, so if you look at the past, you see there are other reasons, even though people really work together, there's lots of reasons why things fall apart. So if you look at the past and, you, and people say, well, why are things in Europe not good since we have left? It's not our fault. It, 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 things have changed. Um, and when things change, they change big time. And if Europe breaks up, then it breaks up. If it keeps together, it keeps together. But we've got to look at messages from the past to help us understand the future. Jessica. Um, I just thought it was a good lecture. Learned about some more cultures that I didn't know about. Yeah, just really good. Thank you. And uh, Anne, you've got the last word. Go for it, Anne. Oh, well, it's very interesting to see the um, comparative uh, Bronze Age uh, in Europe as opposed to the Bronze Age in Britain, you know, and what what they were doing and what we were doing, you know. And, and Anne's point is dead right. What we've got, we've got the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age, the new age, the new period. And then we've got like a weird Dark Age period and then we go into the classical Greece and then we've got the modern age, we've got democracy, um, we've got um, civilization, we've got all those things that go bump in the night. So really the, the precursors of modern day society come back all the way from the age of ancient Greece, uh, yeah. which is an amalgam of everything that Egypt was, the, the Hittites. And then you go to Rome, um, you know, the, the power struggle of influence goes to Rome, uh, and then this is the emergence. So what I'm going to say is if there's nothing else to be said, I will see those of you tonight. Make sure you've got your maps tonight. Uh, anyone want to ask anything can do afterwards. I'll see any of you next Tuesday and I'll see um, those of you for the lecture next Thursday. Um, and thank you very much. Jessica, stay on. And anyone else wants a quick chat. Thank you very much. No, no. Goodbye, Bye. Dale. Goodbye, Bye, Pat. And Henry and Bill and everyone yeah. else with and Jess's. Yeah, oh, Bill, fine. Bill. fine. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank bye, you very guys. much. Bye. 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 Go, oh, Bill, mm -hmm. if you're going to go to the um, walk, we won't do coffee on wet on Tuesday. All right. <laughs> well, hang on. You can do coffee without Bill. Yeah. Anyway, I think Bill's gone. Anyway, um, right. Henry. Okay. Bye. Right. All right then. Bye. Right, who's, who's left? I'll, I'll just leave you to look at my little email that I sent you. Uh, all right, then I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do anyway, that. have a good week. Yeah, thanks for all the emails. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye bye. Don't look up Sin Eaters. It's quite disgusting. <laughs> I, I, t I, t I tell you what, right? I, I was, what happened, right? I was, I'd gone to make a cup of tea, right? And I heard all this weird talk. So nobody knew I was there. I was sitting and it was just, they were talking at this one woman was talking. Well, they used to eat uh, food off uh, um, people's breasts when they're dead and they used to lick off the salt and i'm thinking is this real um and, and then uh, somebody else agreed they said yeah i've read about that as well i know all about that and then somebody else and i thought my god is this a coven of lunatics i don't think i'm going to be going down that road <laughs> i don't think you should go down lantra at all no i'm staying away from it anyway enjoy night night Henri. night night Bye. night, night. Night. No. Bye, Jessica. No, Bye. No, 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 no. Right, what I was going to say, Jess, right? Something, something's yeah. occurred to me, right? So what's going to happen is archaeology company will, will remain, but we're, but we're trying to register archaeology. Um, we're going to call it archaeology online virtual, right? So that's, that's yeah. what the official business will be called. But... Um, I'm thinking that, that the new website should actually be called an online college because that's what it is. So um, anyway, if you've got any thoughts about that over the next um, couple of weeks, that's great. And uh, we, we'll need to chat about your, your cast, um, you, that and what, what you want to do and whether you want to do it and all the rest yeah. of it. We'll have a chat soon. So, so enjoy your week. I'm still getting over the weekend and we will see you tonight. Yeah, see you tonight, Carl. Have a nice break. See you in a bit. I, I need to lie down. Yeah, night night. <laughs> night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Anyway, thank you for uh, listening to that. And uh, 
Phew, last lecture of the week. So I've done this one um, this morning and one last night, which was another subject. Um, I've done uh, one yesterday and I've done two on Tuesday, one on Monday. And uh, yes, I've got another lecture tonight. Keeps things going. It pays the bills. Take care, guys. Um, hang on, what do we do? End.